I'm Michael Janich. Uh, I'm the Special Projects Coordinator for Spyderco. I'm also the founder and lead instructor of Marshall Blade Concepts and Counter Blade Concepts. And I've been involved in the cutlery industry formally since about 1992 in one way or another, either writing, designing, uh, or in some way being involved in knives and knives manufacturing. When I started getting into knives, uh, my original interest in knives started when I first got involved in the martial arts. So when I was studying a system called American Self-Protection when I was about 12 or 13 years old, we were learning knife defenses, how to defend empty-handed against a knife attack. And the techniques we were learning weren't particularly good. I complained to my instructor about them and he basically said, if you want to learn how to defend against a weapon, learn how to use the weapon. It made perfect sense to me, so I started to explore different aspects of uh, combative use of knives, looking at all the World War II stuff, looking at World War I stuff, traditional martial arts, both Japanese and Filipino, and the more that I got into understanding knives, the more fascinated I became with the, the nuances of knife design. And it was something where I started to appreciate why some knives work better for certain tasks than others, and it really was just uh, kind of a fascinating pursuit. It was a, a deep rabbit hole where we take one of our simplest tools but we have such variety and such versatility depending on what we're trying to accomplish with it. The first opportunity I had to design a knife was actually with the Masters of Defense Knife Company back in 1998. It was actually late 1997 when they approached me and their concept was to design a knife, to, to, to literally have people who were accomplished edge weapon trainers or who had combative experience with knives have them design knives, which at that time was pretty revolutionary. Um, so actually having tactical experts designing tactical knives, what a concept. Um, and when I designed that, I had a fairly short runway to get that done. Uh, I designed it based on what I thought I knew. So it had uh, an upswept blade, kind of a buoy style blade, because buoys, of course, are great fighting knives. And it, it basically replicated a lot of what was commonly thought to be the, the quality characteristics of a defensive knife at that time. Uh, it was called the Tempest. It did a great job, it accomplished the goal, I was proud of it. But when I had a chance to design a little bit later on, I decided, you know what, I'm going to start from scratch. I want to start looking at performance characteristics and really start uh, quantifying what I think is important and make sure that I'm not just regurgitating what everyone else said and reinventing the wheel. I wanted to be able to start from scratch and if nothing else, validate what was being said through personal experience. And what I ended up with was a very different approach to things. I ended up embracing the Warncliffe blade uh, and that was done through actual test cutting. Uh, I created a thing called a pork man, which is basically uh, a pork roast or a, a large pork tenderloin, about three to five pounds. Would butterfly it open, wrap it around a piece of wood, tie it on with twine, and then wrap it with a bunch of uh, saran wrap or plastic wrap to basically replicate like a human arm, a human leg, the, some of the targets that I'd be going after defensively if I had to use a knife in personal defense. And I figured that was a great way to quantify the actual cutting performance of different knives. And a lot of the knives that I thought were the ideal tactical knife didn't perform that well, whereas things that had a straighter cutting edge, a Warncliffe profile, specifically Frank Senefonte's designs, actually cut way better than I ever expected. And for me, it set a new standard. Um, probably for me, the turning point after designing that first knife, I had written an article about a guy named Mike Snowdy, a custom knife maker. The article helped him launch his knife making career, and out of gratitude, he said, I want you to design a knife for me. And that was part of the catalyst for me, kind of exploring things on my own. And he wanted to have the perfect neck knife. And what I ended up designing, this is actually the original prototype. There's no edge on this, but it was more of kind of a concept model of what I had in mind. And what I wanted, again, was that Warncliffe style profile, completely straight cutting edge. I wanted it to taper down to the point, And I wanted it to support what I prefer as my grip, which is what I call a Filipino grip. What that does is it allows you to place your thumb on the back of the blade. So anytime you reach out to cut anything, that thumb gives you that, uh, the accuracy that you need. We've all been ringing doorbells, pushing buttons, everything else. We have that inherent skill as far as being able to touch things accurately. So to make the knife a natural and instinctive extension of the hand, I use the thumb on the back of the blade. Well, Mike Snowdy got this and he was basically kind of skeptical. He's like, you know, I've never seen a tactical knife with a Warncliffe profile. I don't know if it really works. He ended up making one, sharpening it, calling me back, and he's like, we got to do this. I've never cut with anything that cuts like this. And what that led to was the first custom Ronins from Mike Snowdy. So this actually is a Damascus version. Uh, these are chisel ground, so it's a deep hollow on one side, completely flat on the other side. But this became kind of the prototypical Janich design as far as Warncliffe profile, uh, designed for an extended thumb grip. 
and it's also tapered so that it fits the natural taper of your hand. When you look at your fingers, they get shorter toward the pinky. So as you place the knife in your hand, you have full surface contact on the handle. And literally the fingertips bottom out against your palm so you know that you have complete contact. It's going to give you the most control and the, and the strongest grip. Around this time is also when I got involved in Spyderco. So I met Sal Glesser. Sal was interested in setting up uh, some type of an edge weapon training program after he had attended Jim Kidding's Riddle of Steel. And uh, originally had another guy who set it up. That guy moved out of town. He recommended me as the replacement. And we started the Marshall Blade Craft program. So MBC initially was Marshall Blade Craft. Still the term that Spyderco prefers to use. And I started teaching here at Spyderco. I was working for Paladin Press at the time, but uh, was teaching here at Spyderco and teaching essentially a four-level course in edge weapon tactics. Sal felt, you know, hey, if you're going to be teaching here, we should have a Spyderco knife that is your signature design. What I showed him was actually something that I started working on. This is a, a handmade prototype that I did. Um, it's not much as far as knife making quality goes, but it illustrated the concept as far as what I was looking for with the design in a folder. Sal wasn't too pleased with this, wasn't really engaged with that at, the, at that particular time, but when I showed him the, the Snowdy knife, he was like, I like this. We, we don't have a really good tactical fixed blade. So what he ended up doing was turning that into a Snowdy Ronin Spyderco version. So this is the FB09. This basically taking the Snowdy custom version and applying that to the Spyderco version. You get, um, instead of the full um, hollow grind on one side and a flat on the other, this is a double flat grind. Uh, but there was only one production run of these made. Uh, this was also early in Spyderco's work as far as uh, Kydex sheaths. They actually had Bob Prezuola come out and teach the staff how to do Kydex sheaths. But I had a very specific style of Kydex sheath that I was trying to achieve for this for a neck knife because what I wanted was something that would be self-writing. So when you hang this around your neck, there was no way for it to spin where you could grab it with it facing in the wrong direction. I also wanted it to be compatible with belt carry, so at that time it had a small tech lock. And what you had was a breakaway chain that was also covered in 550 cord, so it was quiet. Um, the problem with this was that the dimensional consistency of the handle, since many of them were hand finished, uh, didn't allow for the sheaths to be really well manufactured in a mass produced sense. So we went from the original sheath, they eventually added a tension adjustment to try to make the sheath feel a little bit tighter. That evolved into a slotted version uh, because they also found that in the production process, sometimes the sheath would retain moisture, which of course was a bad thing, so they slotted those to make them breathe better. And eventually it evolved into this. Um, but the, the original Ronin did one production run, it really didn't go very far. And at that time, people weren't quite ready for a Warncliffe tactical blade. They just didn't quite get it. Once people saw it cut, they embraced the idea, but for most people, just kind of judging it, it didn't click. So around this time, Sal also said, you know, we're best known for folding knives. Spyderco is best known for folders. Um, again, he wasn't completely on board with this design. So he said, can you take that concept and kind of make it into something that is more in a Spyderco style? So I designed um, a knife that I call the Yojimbo. Um, designed a trainer to go along with it because a purpose designed folding trainer is huge as far as being able to actually train and develop skill and gave that to, to Sal. It was in the works. Spyderco was going through some challenges at that time. I didn't realize that and I was impatient like most people are. So what I ended up doing was I went back to Mike Snowdy and I said, hey, I need to call in a favor. So what I did was I sent him a drawing of the design and he did a one-off um, Yojimbo. So Spyderco round hole. This is D2 tool steel, um, solid carbon fiber scales, titanium liners, and this is the liner lock version. And this was basically kind of a one-off. What I asked him to do was make one of them, put a picture up on the internet, try to drive some interest and see if we can't put a little bit of pressure on Spyderco. It worked. Um, and what we ended up with was the Spyderco version, which is basically this. So the Spyderco Yojimbo was produced in two different versions. You had a black, uh, excuse me, a black handle version and a blue handle version, because back in that, at that time, there were only four colors of G10 that were available. We're spoiled now with all these different colors of G10 and micarta and everything else. Back then, you had four colors and that was it because it was produced primarily for the electronics industry. That's why this is IBM blue. My goal was to make it denim blue, but it just wasn't possible at the time. So the idea with the Ojimbo was, when you look at it, you say there's a lot of handle for a little bit of blade. Back then, you could still carry knives on planes. 
So FAA regulations stated that you could have a four inch blade under normal security regulations, a three inch blade, which is what this one is, under heightened security. So what I did was I planned for, even under heightened security, if there was an alert and you were traveling, you could still carry this legally on a plane at that time, pre-September 11th. What I wanted was something that had a long enough handle to where I could really grip it tightly and still give me a little bit of impact potential at the bottom. So if I wasn't able to get the knife open, let's say that I drew the knife, couldn't open the blade quickly enough, I still had something I could use as an impact tool and then be able to get the blade open and finish the job. <clears throat> it had jimping on the thumb ramp here, so again for that extended thumb position. Nice integral uh, single finger choil here, kind of reminiscent of a lot of uh, Fred Perrin's work. And again what you have is that taper so that it actually fits the hand and allows the fingertips to bottom out against the palm. It was also one of Spyderco's first compression locks, and it's a compression lock that had a different style of detent. The detent was actually uh, a milled shelf in the side of the blade, uh, so it's not as aggressive as the, the ball bearing detents we have now, but it was essentially a work in progress at that particular point. So the Ojimbo came out, um, again, for the people who understood it or took the time to understand it, they loved it. Once they saw it cut, once they did pork band demonstrations with it, people were lining up to buy them. Um, everybody else kind of looked at it and said, you know, it looks like a box cutter on steroids. I don't quite get it. It doesn't make sense. And it was just, again, that work in progress as far as trying to, to convert people's mindsets to get them to embrace that. Um, ultimately, I ended up getting a job offer uh, to work for uh, Black Hawk Products Group, Masters of Defense, the original company that I had worked for or had designed for, was purchased by Black Hawk. Um, I took an opportunity to go to work for them. I left my job at Paladin Press and when I went to work there, started designing more knives for a different company. Um, worked for them for five years, ultimately they lost interest in doing knives, discontinued or dissolved my position and I was looking for an opportunity. So I approached Spyderco and I asked Sal and Eric, you know, hey, would you have any opportunities that might fit my skill set? And they were kind enough to, to give me an opportunity to work here. So one of the first orders of business, Sal asked me, we want you to design another knife. Are, are you up for it? I said, yeah, definitely. Said, what do you have in mind? I said, well, I don't think the original Yojimbo really had its day, so to speak. Uh, and I've learned a lot since I designed that first one as far as what I really appreciate in knife design. Some things were valid, some things needed fine tuning. So what that led to was the Ojimbo 2, the second generation. And basically what I did with this, you still have the straight, uh, perfectly straight cutting edge. We went with a hollow grind because that's what Spyderco was producing in-house at the time. It also gives you lots of strength at the spine of the blade and mass at the spine of the blade. So one of my preferences is being able to open the knife and get it out quickly. Having that blade mass definitely helps with that. Um, I eliminated the jimping on the back of the, of the uh, thumb ramp and basically created something that is more contoured that fits the hand even better. The handle design is similar to the original Yojimbo, but you notice that it has a palm swell here that actually fills the palm a little bit better, gives you a little bit more comfortable grip. Um, rather than a pronounced single index finger groove, what I did was went with a little bit more of a double finger groove here, so this accommodates both fingers, accommodates different hand sizes a little bit better. You still have the taper here so that it fits the, the shape of the hand. And it also is a four position clip, tip, out, tip up, tip down, left or right side carry. So for people who do prefer to carry tip down, I'm a tip up, tip up guy, but some people do prefer this carry method. I want to make sure that I accommodated their preferences as well. So basic construction, the compression lock, everything else, very similar to the first, uh, first generation version, but definitely some design refinements that make it even better. So, obviously during the time that I was trying to promote the, uh, the Warncliffe as a tactical blade, did make some progress in that regard. People started to come around. Um, I think stylistically also this knife is more appealing than the original version. Uh, so this came out in late 2011 and has been going strong ever since. The next order of business was I started clamoring for a training version. It took a number of years to actually get one into production because of production limitations here at the Spyderco factory. Once we were able to expand our factory, expand our capacity, it made room for designs such as this, but the numerous holes in the handle are designed to equalize the weight to within a few grams of the live blade version, but you still have a completely blunted edge and a blunted tip. So what you have is a knife that is mechanically identical to this, so you could draw it from your pocket, open it, and then make safe contact with a partner. Um, and essentially integrate all your skills that you would need if you had to use a knife defensively. 
So the latest iteration of this, and again, this is based on largely feedback we've gotten from our foramites, people like black blades. From a functional standpoint, black blades, where they fall into the mix for military applications, for tactical applications, shiny things get you shot. So if you've ever been on a patrol, you've ever been in the military, uh, before the patrol, you're looking for light discipline, noise discipline. So anything that rattles, anything that is shiny and reflective, you're trying to eliminate that before you go out in the field. Um, for a knife of this size, it's debatable whether the, the non-reflective aspect of it is really worthwhile, unless it's in a military context. But from an aesthetic standpoint, this thing is beautiful. So the, the DLC coating on the blade, and also this is the first Spyderco knife uh, with a compression lock that also has black coated liners. So that's something that um, people again have been, been asking for. Uh, I'm proud that Spyderco chose to incorporate that stuff on my, my knife. Uh, so this is the latest version of the Ojimbo, still CPM S30V stainless steel. All the other features and everything of the satin finished version are identical. The only difference is the DLC coating on the blade and then black coating on all the other handle hardware, including the liners. A little sideline to this, when you look at uh, the evolution of the Ojimbo 2, uh, I was teaching out in Ohio, Nikki Yurko, uh, noted custom knife maker and a career law enforcement officer, uh, great knife maker. He took the Ojimbo 2, the very first one that I got back in 2011, put it on a piece of paper, traced around it. And the next time I saw him, he gave me this. He's like, I don't make folders, but I wanted to thank you for all the training you've given me, so I made a fixed blade. I showed this off um, to Eric and asked Eric if I could allow Mickey to make a few of these. Commissioned a few from Mickey, picked them up at the blade show, brought them back. Eric looked at it again and he's like, hey, can I put this in the prototype case? One thing led to another and the prototype got enough attention to where that actually led to the Ronin 2. So once again, when we go back kind of full circle to the original Spyderco Ronin here, first generation, not that well received, uh, now kind of a rare collector's item. Now that we've kind of come full circle to the Ronin 2, um, this actually has been very successful as a fixed blade. People, again, have been educated as far as the utility of the tactical Warncliffe, and um, it's finally uh, gaining some ground as far as a concept, and a lot of people are trusting their lives to these, which for me, I couldn't be more grateful. I'm a big fan of the compression lock, and I'm really happy that the compression lock was used on all of my Spyderco folders, um, at least as far as the Yojimbo and the Yojimbo 2. The reason the compression lock is so good uh, for a tactical folding knife, first of all, strength. When you look at the various strengths that Spyderco has in-house, anything that is MBC rated or Marshall Blade Craft rated holds 200 inch pounds of pressure per inch of blade length. So through our empirical testing, through actual destructive testing of knives, we validate that. So what you look at is a lock that is super strong and is literally so strong that it's hard for the human hand to hang on to the knife to exert more pressure than what the lock will hold. So it's going to be very reliable. Um, when it comes to opening, getting the knife open, when you compare this to a back lock or some of the other lock mechanisms where there's a very strong spring tension that holds the blade closed, opening this is also easier and more fluid than you would have with other lock designs. When you're gripping it tightly, especially in standard grip where the, the blade is extending from the thumb side of the hand, the lock release is placed into the softest part of your hand, basically the web of the thumb right here. So what that means is it's very, very unlikely that you're ever going to be able to inadvertently release the lock under use. So you can be using this thing, I mean, literally fighting for your life, and it's not going to inadvertently release. Finally, when it comes to closing the knife, you don't have to put your fingers in the way of the edge. Unlike a liner lock, with the liner lock, what you have to do is place your thumb here, start to close the blade a little bit, and then get your thumb out of the way and close it. So for just a moment there, you're tempting fate a little bit. With the compression lock, especially from a utility standpoint, I can open the knife, I can cut whatever it is I need to cut, I close the knife, and I never get my fingers in the way of the edge. And for many people, a lot of folks will look at the Ojimbo and they'll say, you know, it looks like a box cutter on steroids. Yes, it does. And when they start using it from a utility standpoint, even if you're not into the tactical side, even if you're not concerned with using a knife for personal defense, what you'll find is, essentially you have all the power you would have with any other blade shape cutting with the heel of the edge. So you can grip this thing and cut with extreme power. When it comes to using the knife for more delicate chores, all you have to do with the wide blade especially, I choke up this way and in a lot of cases what I'll do is place my index finger on the end here and I've literally got a scalpel. If you've got to pick out a splinter, if you've got to cut something that is, you know, 
uh, very delicate. You can cut with precise control with this. So it literally kind of gives you the best of all worlds. And when you think about it, if you go down to Home Depot, if you go down to any home improvement store and you look for a utility knife, what are you going to find? You're going to find essentially a Warncliffe blade. It's going to have that same taper coming down toward the tip. It allows you to cut with full power all the way to the point. So from a utility standpoint, from a personal defense standpoint, cutting is cutting. The more effectively you can do it, the better off you're going to be. Very few people in this world get to live their dream. And when it comes to designing knives, when it comes to being involved in the knife industry, when it comes to working with tools that I truly love, working for Spyderco is literally a dream come true for me. I recently celebrated my 10th anniversary with Spyderco. Hope to have many more years with the company. And I'm very proud to have the opportunity to be able to design knives that are well received by our customers and to be able to stand behind these and share my story with you.